Dark, a podcast about the CW's Riverdale that's getting unionized, so get ready. I'm Alex. When you walk through darkness for too long, your eyes can adjust, and then you see something bright, and you're like, whoa, that's too bright. And that's why you need to hide out in a little bunker that is formerly used for sex, and is now an interdimensional door where everything is always happening. I'm Justin. And we are going to be talking about Riverdale Season 6, Episode 16, Chapter 111, Blue Collar. Woo, that's a mouthful right there. But let's do some recap before we get into this, because lots of stuff is going on in the town of Riverdale, as usual. So, Percival Pickens is trying to take over the town, maybe by building a ghost train. He's building a ghost train. He's uh, building a a ghost train. A normal thing that you do when you want to make a a play to be like a mayor. Like a good mayor is always building some sort of ghost (laughs) train. Ghost train, ghost uh, subway, ghost That's how Mayor McCheese took over McDonald's, Uh, is he built a ghost train. Long term, that was pretty bad for McDonald's, I think. We can all yeah, agree. Yeah, well, he owns the souls of the living and dead who uh, <laughs> enter um, any McDonald's. Which is, Grimace any, is his literally throne. anybody entering McDonald's, but we won't get into that. So he's building a ghost train to suck the power of the ghosts who live in Pops and uh, presumably other ghosts. There may be some other details there, but we're not 100% sure. But he has Didn't recruit- see a lot of the Pops <laughs> ghosts today. No, I guess maybe off. they were off. <laughs> They were probably yeah. boxing in the boxing side of the boxing gym because we should mention that Pops is now in El Royale, the boxing gym, to Just keep it safe you, from the railroad. Yeah, 100%. It makes total sense. If you're a ghost, though, you're like, oh, we're moving? <laughs> Never does a ghost get to move like that. They got to be so psyched. Yeah. New location, Very new fun. kitchen setup, Assume I'm assuming. Very fun. Uh, By the way, I want to give a little side note here. So after I watch episodes of Riverdale on Sunday, I've usually been telling uh, my oldest kid and my wife about just giving the rundown of the craziest moments. And I mentioned Wait a second. Of- wait, wait. You do like a practice podcast with your family? I do. You <laughs> bastard. <laughs> this is second run material? You've already done all this? I'm, I, that's why you can tell all the material that I'm using right now is really well workshopped. Let me just say real quick that um, I consider any conversation with your family a practice podcast. Is that normal? <laughs> is that a normal way to talk about? I think so. Like, talking I think to so. people. I, whenever, instead of family meetings, I say, hey, can we have a podcast real quick? <laughs> yeah. Is this a practice? <laughs> Should we run tape on this? Dad? <laughs> but I was mentioning the thing about the ghost trade, and I said, yeah, they had to move Pops over to Pell Royale. And my wife immediately was like, wait, isn't, doesn't Tony have a bar under there? And I was like, Justin keeps saying that. Yeah, Justin exactly. keeps bringing that up. I'll bring yeah. that up on the regular podcast. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> See? But Great. just to keep on, because we're getting a little yes, in the weeds yes, here sorry. about my family or whatever. So Percival's building the ghost train. He's recruited all the workers. Archie is pretty pissed about that. But he's been teaming up with Tabitha and working pretty heavily to try to turn things around in Riverdale. Meanwhile, Betty, who is dating Archie, has been working with Agent Drake, who knows a lot mm. about the supernatural in the town of Riverdale and otherwise, as well as helping track down TBK, the trash bag killer. This episode, though, a little bit of a swerve for Betty because we get a return from Charles, who is her serial killer brother, who formerly was part of the FBI, very briefly got married to Chick, the true hero of Riverdale, Riverdale. before being stabbed and taken back to prison. He pops up again this episode. Also, probably important to mention that Alice is fighting with Betty and basically said she was the worst daughter ever last episode. That comes back in literally no way this episode, but I'm sure we'll... (laughs) 
You sort of get where she gets it from. Sure. If you're, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll get into that in a moment. Uh, other characters we should talk about. We mentioned Tony Topaz earlier. She proposed to Fangs in the last episode, partially or maybe in large part because she wants to keep custody of baby Anthony, her baby. Fangs has been very much doubling down on he doesn't want to give at all. He wants to rejoin the serpents. He wants to keep them a gang. Tony wants to turn them into sort of a more Hell's Angel community outreach type organization and Kevin is going pretty hard to try to get custody of baby Anthony he has teamed up with Percival Pickens who smooched him a couple of episodes back however he seems to at least in this episode still be dating Moose Mason who has returned to Riverdale as the physical education coach that part doesn't play much into this episode but just so you know just so you know what everybody's jobs are I guess yeah and it's good uh physical education um long way of saying Jim teacher yep uh i appreciate it though um and moose is back moose is like fully back i think yeah he he seems fully back uh there's a theory going around that moose is imagined and something that percival has put in kevin's brain but given the way that moose acts this episode i think it's pretty fair to say that he is actually there he's definitely throwing a little cold water on kevin's plans (laughs) but uh, not to jump too far ahead let me just finish up the recap here sure so cheryl is practicing to be a witch with heather her crush from back in junior high school who moved to greendale but has moved back in ostensibly to build a library in thornhill but mostly because they kind of like each other so that's what's going on with them jughead and veronica have been doing a mentalist act at the casino together jughead not so much of an act because he literally can actually read minds so that's going on and i feel like there's a character i'm probably forgetting but I don't know. We'll get to it. I think that's Reggie. Is Reggie. With Reggie is working for PP Percival Pickens. He wants to learn magic from Percival, and he has teamed up to him, seemingly of his own volition. I guess the last character we mentioned is Uncle Frank is also working for Percival Pickens. They tried to break him out of the spell in the previous episode, but it just did not work. So there you go. So that's everything you need to know about Riverdale. Now you're 100% completely caught up. Oh, wait. Actually, there is an alternate universe called Rivervale that was explored in the first five episodes of the season. Rivervale and Riverdale almost had a crisis on infinite Earths and collided together. However, they were saved when the jughead of Rivervale hid away in the sex bunker and decided to tippity-tap type on his typewriter and write the adventures of everybody for the rest of all time. That actually comes back at the end of this episode. What were you going to say, Joe? we predicted. Yes. We called this one, which is always exciting. Yeah. There's a couple right. of things we called. We also, I think... Kind of called Agent Drooper rising in this episode. Hashtag Agent Drooper is coming. Uh, we got a little Agent bit more Drew. of that in the promo for the next episode. Not to jump ahead, but there's a quote where Veronica seemingly says to Betty, are you hot for Agent Drake? Which has sent a lot of people in a lot of different directions. Some people are very excited to see Bye Betty. Some people are upset, particularly Barchi fans, because right. they don't want another cheating storyline. Totally fair. Uh, Not to start off with this, but because I believe this is the big conversation of the fandom today, why don't we, I I was curious to get your temperature on it as a big Barchi fan. How do you feel about this bubbling potential infatuation, flirtation, whatever you want to call it with Agent Drake? It's definitely there. Like the chemistry is there. Um, I'm curious. It feels like the actual uh the the heat of that infatuation is coming from Drake toward Betty. Mm-hmm. Betty seems very receptive to it. Um so I'm curious what the the turn in next episode will be if it's if Veronica's just noticing like hey Agent Drake is on you or if Betty actually is sort of feeling something similar. Um because I, I actually I don't know if Betty's interest because they in the episode last last week where we sort of introduced this idea of Agent Drake um, being attracted to Betty, Betty was like, "Ooh, okay," and then she went back to Archie and was like, "There was not even a, a moment of hesitation. We never saw any sort of like." her being pulled back from him. So it feels like whatever's happening, we're not privy to the internal thoughts of Betty yet. Mm -hmm. And even this promo is Veronica observing it. So um, I'm, I'm not so like, I'm, I'm down with whatever the show wants to do. I said last time, agent drink does seem like she's coming on really strong, like as if she's doing it for an ulterior motive. Um, But 
I, I think she's a great character. I really like her, especially in this episode. She's such a great like driver for this action. Mm-hmm. And she's so like, she knows what's up and she's like, let's go do this, which I love that energy, especially from Veronica and, and everybody. Yeah, it's definitely a super fun character. And I, I agree with you. I think there's a bunch of different directions they could go in here, but in this episode as well, I don't get any sense that there's problems in Barchi land. They still seem yeah. to be together, working together, like each other, love each other, all of these things. So I do think there is a way of doing this storyline where, you know, Veronica and Betty are having, and this is a total prognostication, but Veronica and Betty are having this conversation. But Betty is talking about how great Agent Drake is and how helpful she's been and going blah, 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 blah. And Veronica calls her out and is like, you're hot for Agent Drake. And that makes her realize, oh, wait a second. Yes, I do. I am like have a little bit of a crush on a woman. You explore the idea that Betty is bisexual, potentially. She has feelings for a woman, but that doesn't necessarily need to break up Archie. It doesn't mean she needs to cheat on Archie or anything like that. She could still realize she is bisexual without the cheating element that I think everybody is worried about. A hundred percent. And also I think there's, you know, gradations of a crush. Like she does seem to be like attracted to her, but I think it's a mix of like, uh, she looks at, she looks at her power that she has. She's very capable at her job, a job that Betty likes, but her life keeps getting in the way. I think she has sort of a, maybe there's a sexual part of it, but I think it's like beyond, it's like a life crush on Mm -hmm. her, which I, I think is, that's, that's cool. And I like the idea of, because we have seen the storyline of someone being like in the show, Cheryl is like, I'm bisexual. Uh, Tony, like, uh, or I guess Tony's bisexual. Cheryl's not. Yeah, Cheryl's uh, a lesbian. But but the uh, we saw that that story happen. So if it is that sort of wider, like having a crush on someone without it being purely about like we have to have sex, I think that's super interesting. Yeah, I agree. And the last thing I'll say in the other direction, though, a lot of folks I think have been calling out the parallels that we've been having with the River Vale storylines, and. I think people really focused on the idea that Betty got pregnant in the first half episode of the Rivervale event, uh, thanks to a pie and Archie having yeah. his heart taken out. A very normal sentence to say. Yeah, but yeah. there, I know this wasn't Betty, this was Bitsy, but there could also be shades of Bitsy figuring out that she does have feelings for it wasn't it was poppy blossom at that time period right and also being pregnant so they could be going in that direction as well that could be something potentially they're exploring so i i don't believe that necessarily they're going to go the cheating direction but there also could be a thing where like drake kisses betty she's not necessarily opposed to it but she's like hold on i'm with archie and then yeah. again realizes that there's some feelings there. So we'll have to see what happens. I mean, happens. the fact that these characters aren't just overwhelmed all the time in general <laughs> by their like nine jobs, four mm-hmm. relationships. Um, so like, I do think there's going to be a point where they have to be like, okay, 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 okay. We're fighting an epic battle for the soul of the Riverdale, of good versus evil. I also need to sort out like the, the couple of la- layers of attraction I have for these four different people. Yeah, there's... Uh, the show was balancing a lot of different things in this episode in particular to that point. Like you have the Betty storyline where she's working with Drake and Veronica to leech the blood out of Charles who mysteriously died probably because he's a serial killer. So that poisoned his blood. And on the other hand, Archie is like, let's seriously talk about unions, you know? So yeah, both things. But but I think I mean they definitely yada yada around the Veronica is going to wash Charles's blood side of it <laughs> by the end of the episode like they go show up to do it and it is successful happens off camera great choice I was like <laughs> when they were setting it up I was like I don't need to see the blood go through Veronica like a little sieve just like cleaning it out <laughs> great um, and but, but I thought they handled the union side of the sh- episode really well like I liked all of Archie's speeches I liked the way uh, the confrontation at the, on the railroad track in Sketch Alley at the end was handled like it was great yeah, it, I guess what I'm saying is it gave me a little bit more tonal whiplash than usual in this episode, right. particularly whenever we'd cut to the Archie storyline, because I do think what Archie and Tabitha was doing was really good. The way that they're talking to the workers are really good. I certainly have some questions about 
how they're striking and how they're unionizing and what that means, but also it's Riverdale, so it doesn't matter. We don't need to get into the minutia of it. You know, it's more broad strokes. But talking about unions is important, and talking about the power of unions is important. So I felt like it felt a little bit like I don't know when they wrote this episode, but wasn't there recently there was a whole crew strike that was going to happen with, uh, I think it was just Vancouver, but maybe it was all of Hollywood. Uh, I don't know. Whatever it was, there was definitely like a lot of union talk that was going on yeah. it, at probably around the same time they were writing this. So it felt very realistic and very present, even though they were applying it to a crew building tracks for a ghost train. Well, there definitely was uh, like around COVID, there was a lot of like, union negotiations that had to be sorted out before all that could happen. So I think that was a part of it. And I, I do think the the unionization efforts going around uh, like different Starbucks and Amazon warehouses, that I think was maybe just starting a little bit when these episodes were being written and shot. So that could be also the influence on it. Yeah. And you also mentioned, uh, I just didn't want to forget this part. This episode was directed by Tara Defoe, who's been on the crew for a really, really long time. And I really did love those shots on the railroad tracks in particular, yeah. just Archie standing in the middle. That was, that was great. That was good stuff. Cool. There was, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say it felt big. It felt like mm -hmm. sort of a big, like eighties movie scene where it was like the hero comes through and is like, we're not going to put up with your shit any longer. And like that's the exact kind of flavor that that lets a storyline that did feel like so different and sort of grounded compared to like um, turning invisible to get the witch book we need um, feel really like bigger. But so it could match like it was shot in a way that it could match the crazier like story of the other storylines. Now, you've talked a lot about how Percival has been constantly winning. We had a little bit of a turn of that in the last episode when they do move pops here. Even though Percival at the end shoots back at Archie, you've never you haven't been in a real fight yet. You don't know what that's like. This is another win for Archie. Right. So how'd you feel about that? Um, yeah, I thought that was a very funny line given uh, like three episodes back, they got in an actual fight. <laughs> he lost. <laughs> He's like, yeah, better fight. I was like, I beg to differ. You kicked my ass oh, pretty recently. Um, but I do like they do. They're doing a great job this season with Percival as a villain. He's such a great villain. And even when he loses, he keeps winning or at least talks about winning and losing. Like he's like, OK, you got my workers briefly, but. I'm coming even harder. Like this is nothing. And it feels like whatever they do, they aren't stopping his plan or even turning it. Like they beat Frank. They've beaten all the sort of mini bosses, but Percival feels sort of untouched. And at the same time, you still get Archie having a win here. So like, I think that's really hard to do to, uh, to have it in balance in that way. And they're doing a great job. I was thinking about a little bit after this episode, i I've said several times on the podcast, I've been a little hesitant about the supernatural elements, about the superpower elements, but I am not hesitant about Percival. I think he, we'll see how it wraps up in another six episodes time, I guess, but he's been this really good organizing principle for the season. You know, it yeah. could have been over the top. It could be very Poochie-esque to use the Simpsons term, but mm -hmm. at the same time, I think like, Chris O'Shea has been doing a great job playing the character. He is a really good villain. And it is this thing that everything revolves around or mostly everything revolves around and focuses on. It's this present thing in almost every storyline or arguably every storyline this episode in particular, though we'll get into the Tony and Fags thing because that's tied in, but also feels like it's on the side in a certain way. But yeah. aside from that, it it really does give a nice focus to the season to have this very, very strong villain that loved Mark as well as his Hiram, but it did feel like it was starting to spin its wheels at a certain point. And he was always not necessarily a side villain. He was usually the main villain, but like there was usually a lot of other things going on in addition to Hiram. So focusing on Percival. Yeah makes the storytelling stronger. Well, he was always the villain to Veronica and Archie primarily, and the other rest of the gang would come help, um, yeah. and they would hate him, but it was rarely was Hiram threatening Jughead directly outside of the main story. And in this, you have Percival having pulled a bunch of our sort of main characters, who we usually like, 
to his side, he's agitating basically everyone mm-hmm. all the time. So like that's I mean, Betty is a little bit dealing with her stuff, um, but she's also very much pulled into the um, the Percival campaign. Yeah, and it's interesting, too, because we, I think, predicted that TBK, the trash bag killer, was going to be the primary antagonist for the season. But if anything, it seems like he's a secondary antagonist at this point and potentially one that they might even deal with in the next episode. Yeah, well, an, an absent antagonist, like a threat, mm-hmm. more of a threat to Betty and something that she's feeling like she needs to prepare for, but not something that she's actually dealing with in a real active way. But I really think, like, arcing uh, Betty's stuff this season, it really is about her wrestling with her internal demons and her family ghosts. And that's why having Charles come back, it really is like that next step, getting closer to finally Betty dealing with herself. And that, I think, reinforces our theory um, that Trashback Killer is a, a sort of a manifestation of Dark Betty. Yeah, we'll definitely have to see, I think, next episode. There's that quick shot in the promo of TBK appearing in the crowd at the serial killer convention. And well, it, that it, turn <laughs> was wild. Yes. Uh, well, uh, getting to that in a second, all I was going to say is that quick shot out totally out of context and like a 10 second promo, who knows? But if you want to go with our theory, uh, I think there's a way that he could be in the crowd and it is imagined by Betty. And ultimately she chases him down and finds that he's nothing or alternately finds that he is something and that he has actually, Dennis. Well, it just a uh, uh, Dennis. Um, Dennis. The yeah. menace. Uh, just to cri- just to crystallize our theory, though, I think we're not saying that Trashback Killer has always been um, her something she imagined. I my my theory, and I think we mm. talked about this, is that Trashback Killer was a real serial killer that captured her. I think she killed him, and then manifested the sort of the the guilt of murdering someone, and all every, all the trauma of what she went through with Trashback Killer has manifested this as sort of an ongoing. Uh, sort of presence in her life. All right. I can, I can buy that. Again, we'll probably find out next episode. Um, the We're jumping a little bit all over the place, but why don't we, very briefly, we talked about Archie's storyline. Um, over the course of it, we get a couple of fun things where, like, he and Tabitha fight back with free coffee and 25 cents burgers, which I thought uh. was a very fun Riverdale thing. I would do anything yeah. for a 25 cent burger. I love the reaction to everyone's like, but oh, burger, oh, yeah, like that's a real, uh, really speaking the language, yeah. Uh, but I, yeah, I, and then oh, go, ahead. go ahead. Oh, you all go. I was gonna say is I also really liked this. Uh, getting back to like the organizing principle thing, this idea that they're using Cheryl as a source once again in this episode. That it isn't Cheryl just off in her own storyline. She is doing her own thing with Heather and that has developing elements, but ultimately she's helping Archie and Tabitha to find this document that reveals what Percival Pickens, great grandfather said. And I'll tell you what, if anybody ever finds a document that my, of anything, my great grandfather said, hold me to that. I am the same person. Yeah. Um, I mean, I will say, like, yes, that is sort of loose evidence, <laughs> you could say. <laughs> um, it really is effective in the the union meeting that they're having. And, mm-hmm. like, the letter is fucked up, obviously. <laughs> oh, of course. So, to be, and also we have the idea that maybe Percival's ancestors are also him. Probably. He is immortal. So I think, um, I think it's fine, to, to your point, like... Uh, unless you have been yourself for multiple generations, slowly doing practice podcasts um, throughout time, uh, building up to this very moment, I think it's okay. When I was my great grandfather, though, I called them practice radio serials. Oh, nice. Um, and you said some fucked up stuff. Uh, uh, it was uh, very racist. Yeah. About the Barchi of uh, <laughs> Woodrow Wilson's love triangle or whatever. Oh, man. He liked that blonde and that brunette, and I only shipped one of them, but I'm not going to say one. Which one? I just follow the story. You know what I'm talking about? And back then, a ship was like just something you put people on so they could go a have steam a ship. relationship. It was a yeah. steamship. <laughs> <laughs> the other uh, part of this, though, while we're talking – oh, were you going to bring up I was just going to talk about like the one Barchi scene we do get there hanging out. She calls him Arch. Like it feels very normal. Betty talking about herself because it does feel like Archie's still who Betty comes to to sort of um, vent and really deal with her stuff. Archie just doesn't see – he's like – he's there for her, but he's also like, I got so much going on. 
So the, I got I, the part that struck me as the weirdest, and I think this was just blocking and it's fine and the way that they, uh, you know, set out the episode. But when she's in the middle of that speech and she looks out the window, which again, great shot, like really yeah. well shot, looks across the, I don't know, it's not an alleyway. What's the space between two houses? Transom. Sure. And sees Alice about to kill Charles with a pillow and is like, oh, my God, and runs across that Archie is like, guess I'll sit here on my bed. And, well, this happening. Not yeah, I'm not going to mess with a Cooper <laughs> yeah, no, family that's, murder. <laughs> that, that, that's a that's a family issue. Sorry. Yeah. You I got like, out here with I'll bingo. handle this. Yeah. <laughs> you never know what he also, he looked at another window and saw something else horrible happening. And I had yeah. to deal with that. He looked out the other side and saw the ice cream man was there. And he's like, hell yeah. Yeah, I'm going to get some ice cream for a, me and my gonna, best girl. Going to get a cherry dip. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah, definitely. Gross. That's the worst thing I would get. I, that that is, last I don't know I would why get anybody show. gets that. That's a terrible ice cream. Uh, yeah. When you got chocolate dip, right? Sitting right next door. Yeah. Um, I, I did want to bring up the Cheryl Heather storyline since we touched yes. on that. So they're doing research. There's some very fun lines here with Cheryl throughout the episode. Uh, but well, to your point where you're saying yeah. earlier about Cheryl sort of just helping them rather than being a source. She is a source and she is helping them, but she hates it. She <laughs> is so pissed at the beginning of the episode. She's like, what do you want to sing Bruce Springsteen covers? Like just such a strong attitude. And honestly, we do want you to sing Bruce Springsteen covers. Yes. Come Absolutely. on, let's do this. Let's yeah. get that musical that, uh, going. Uh, do you think they, uh, this is total speculation, but do you think in the writer's room they were like, we should have her sing a Bruce Springsteen song and then they just couldn't get the rights, so they put the line in there? Well, yeah, because also, like, what song do you really, the, all the sort of, there's like the power ballad E ones, mm -hmm. great, but doesn't really apply to the union side of it. And then you want to hear like Ghost of Tom Joad coming out of Cheryl's <laughs> mouth? I don't think so. That song's Born in the USA. Do that. Yeah. Jazz up the workers. Whatever it was, very fun meta line. Really like that. Also, she had a great aside right before that where Tabitha says, Percival is all about control. And then Cheryl says, and Tweed. Yeah. Just very fun. slams, withering slams. Veronica shows up to be like, hey, um, I'm trying to start an absinthe business. I need your book on absinthe and all of your at wormwood that you have growing. I was like, Veronica. <laughs> and Cheryl's like pissed, but she's like, OK, I'll go do it. Yeah, because she's in the middle of talking to Heather, which is basically her study date here. Uh, the uh, line I really liked right at the beginning there, I'm sorry we had to put my witch training on hold for research, <laughs> which uh, this show has come very far since the first season. A hundred percent. I feel like owning how ridiculous so much of this is, like in that same scene when Cheryl's like, I have something to confess. I didn't bring you here to open a private library in Murder Town. <laughs> I'm actually, I was like, ah, oh, great ownership of the nonsense there. And I really like the Cheddar relationship. You, they're both just like boiling with attraction to each other. Mm -hmm. And you see that in all their scenes and mixed with like the actual like witch um, education stuff, like the invisibility scene I thought was great, dramatic. Well done. Heather as this outside force that PP doesn't know about or no one really knows about is cool. She's like a secret weapon. Yeah, I think as not just Riverdale watchers, but also as TV watchers were trained to look at any new characters on these type of shows with suspicion. And that particularly goes for Agent Drake. That goes for Heather coming from weird, mysterious circumstances in the background. And there 100% definitely could be a turn with both of them. Next episode, we could find that random Agent Drake is TBK's daughter theory could be totally true. And I wouldn't believe yeah. an eye. Heather could be an evil witch who is trying to, her whole plan is to get the Malleus Maleficarum. Is that what it's Good. called? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Translated as the witch hammer. I looked that one up. Nice. But she, they could have nefarious intentions, but I think right now, they're not, and that's also fine. You know, Riverdale yeah. turns on a dime all the time. And just based on this episode, even though I'm ride or die for Shoney, I think Heather is a very sweet nerd is the way that Carolyn yeah. Day is playing her. 100%. And it's very cute, this relationship. So um, I I hope Shoney is endgame. I still think they're going to come back. But as it is right now, I'm liking watching this. And uh, it's fun. The witch training is fun. Yeah, and I agree with you. I do think Shoni is still endgame, but this is a great relationship and something that has 
is making Cheryl like we talked about how uh, separately Tony and Cheryl weren't connecting and weren't really working out the last couple of times we've seen them together. And I think this is an important step for Cheryl to like come back to her feelings and like be able to move past all of the bad things that have happened in her life so she can like trust people again. And it does seem like she's moving in that direction, but she's still bothered by so many people. All the time. <laughs> well, Cheryl's going to be Cheryl. I think that's the main thing is that like she softens for Tony here. We see her in this episode. She softens for Heather as well. By the end, when she confesses that, like you were saying, she uh, lured Heather here under uh, circumstances, Lib- library pretenses, library pretenses. There you go. Uh, but yeah, Works they like time. each other and that's cute. And I think like you're saying, we'll see Cheryl grow from this, even though Cheryl will still have those nasty asides to everybody all the time, because that's what Cheryl Blossom does. Well, and let me throw this out before we move on. Like if, if Shoni is Endgame, how is the Cheddar relationship? Cause it's tied up with mentoring on a, as a witch mm-hmm. I feel like My prediction is um, Heather will end up Sacrificing herself In some capacity For Cheryl I think that's fair Or she'll have Some sort of thing Where uh, We'll have So there was a little bit Of a rumor This is unconfirmed But that the 19th episode Is called The Witches of Riverdale Which is yep. Also what Roberto Garcia Had teased Would have been the idea For the next season Of Chilling Adventures Of Sabrina so to wildly spin that out of control, what would be awesome is if they are able to bring in a significant amount of portion of the cast of Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, you end up with some sort of thing with this Malleus Maleficorum where Heather says, you know, what? we need to take it back to Greendale. We need to watch it all the time and keep it safe. So I I love you. I have feelings for you, but I can't be any, here anymore. Yeah. So and like we're saying... Tony and Fangs, again, we'll get to that in a moment, but are on their own path. But I don't think that's going to last. I don't think that's going to be long term. Wow. That's clearly. They, again, agreed to be married in this episode. <laughs> and you're like, exactly. Perfect chess move to get Tony back with Cheryl. Well, uh, again, I, I want to talk about So that you're in... saying there's a chance. <laughs> you are Jim Carrey and Dumb 100%. and Dumber. For what, sure. I am definitely Dumb and Dumber in this scenario. Yeah, but yeah. Cheryl. I, I, like you're saying, I think we're going to end up with a scenario where Heather and Cheryl are going to have this really nice, positive relationship that's going to literally and figuratively let Cheryl own her power. And then ultimately, Heather will return to Greendale, sacrifice herself, something like that. So Cheryl will be back to a place where she's alone, but feeling more confident in her aloneness than she was before. Because she started, the, I think she started this season thinking she was cursed and... yeah. Um, Maybe that was last season, I'm honestly forgetting. But whatever it is, she was not in a good place when we started off here. And I think she will be a good place when we end, which is going to set up the final season, which is going to set up Tony and Cheryl in some respect. We just got to get over that pesky marriage thing first. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. Pesky marriage thing. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. this is going to be great. So I, I thought I was on with Pete LePage briefly here when I was talking <laughs> to you about that. But sure, uh, sure. I'm definitely... I. Pete obviously is not here this week. I'm definitely peeing out, but for Jashodi, I am well aware of that. I, yeah. Are you? Does it change your behavior, the fact that nope. you're aware of it? I 100% don't think so. does not. Uh, great. Do we want to talk uh, about Tony and Fags? Because, uh, again, yeah. uh, like I was this last episode, uh, there are things about this storyline that I understand on an intellectual level, and then there are other things that I just feel like, what are we doing here? What are we doing with these characters? What is happening? Well, I, cause I agree with you. It is a little like Tony makes a full, like does a full 180 over the course of this episode. Um, and we start with them, uh, meeting with a lawyer who's like, Hey, it's hard to re- retain custody of this kid when you're in a, a, a biker gang that is in your multiple arrests and, and convictions and whatnot. Um, it feels like that's like, that's our starting point here. Um, and we get Fang sort of in in the union plot as well, just being like a, a player in the game. Not doesn't really affect much. And then, but he does challenge Kevin to he p- almost punches Kevin uh, because Kevin is with PP. And uh, it I, it's hard to tell. Like I, 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 Fangs is acting sort of irrationally, but like I'm not like that's out of line. 
Like he's just being rash. Fangs is here. Here's the thing that bothered me about this plot line in this episode. And I want to couch this in again. Intellectually, I understand that everything that's motivating Tony is she needs to keep custody of her baby. That is the baseline. She is going to protect this baby no matter what. The baby needs to stay with her. She will do everything in her power to keep baby Anthony. So I get that. And I get that those high emotions can lead to a lot of rash actions. But Fangs, I don't like it, but he is consistent in this episode, and he is consistently yeah. making dumb, not budging decisions. Like that meeting with the lawyer where he's like, nah, we're in a gang. We're going to stay a gang. I don't care about my arrests. Who cares? And Tony is like, I'm trying to do the work here. I am trying to work with this lawyer to keep my baby, our baby, what are you doing, Fags? And he's like, no, nope, yeah. not giving an inch. Forget it. And by the end of the episode, which is very frustrating, Tony, for some reason, comes around to Fang's side and is like, yeah. yes, let's not give an inch, despite the fact that the lawyer told us not to do that. Well, I because I, I agree with you. I was like, especially the fight that that they have in the middle where she's like, you are risking everything for this dumb fight with Kevin and I was like fully on Tony's side. I was like, 100%. yes, that was stupid. But then when it comes around and <laughs> she beats the shit out of Kevin uh, with brass knuckles to get the pacifier back um, and then fully comes around, I was like, I mean, this actually tracks more with Tony too. Like Tony was like, I'm a serpent for life. Uh, so like, I, I it's a weird storyline in that you're like, this uh, Fangs is wrong. Then it's like, wait, Tony actually agrees with Fangs when you think about the history. And then eventually she's like, okay, let's do this. It just feels like they're up against a custody battle that you can't serpent your way out of. Right. 100%. What, like, what are they going, what is the end result here? Because them doubling down on being at a biker gang that does crimes, even if mostly the serpents have not done crimes over the course of several seasons and in fact bid what Tony is trying to sell anyway most of the time. Yeah. It's just not going to work out for them. Like there's no positive result there that isn't going to end up with Kevin, despite the fact that he has nothing in his corner at this point other than Percival. Like we even find out by the end of the episode that he is not biologically the kid's father. So Kevin has no leg to stand on other than the fact that he is not in the serpents. And Tony and Fags are doubling down on the idea, the one thing that is going to make them lose. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. But I think because I think Tony and Fangs are acting as they've always acted. The mm-hmm. weird factor here that is harder to talk about is Kevin. Kevin is a villain so far this season. He's working with PP without the mind control. Like the crazy part is that the mind control that Percival was using on all of these characters is gone. Like Kevin's not being controlled by him through supernatural means. He's being like, he's been given a nice apartment. He's been like, there's like whatever that kiss was like, there's other sort of normal quote unquote mind control happening, like influence in the way that a lot of people are made to do bad things by a bad person in real life. But the actual like mentalism that was happening before with Frank, uh, Kevin and anybody is sort of gone. Alice. Well, I do wonder, they haven't really established this necessarily, and I don't know necessarily they will, but my interpretation is that basically Percival almost did like a cult thing on them, broke them down, turned them to his will, and now he doesn't need to mind control them all the time because they're already on his side. But, right. But yeah, to your point, yes, Kevin Kevin is just uh, – it's it's a bummer to watch to the point that you're making because like – the scene that where Tony comes in and beats the shit out of Kevin in the middle of dinner with Moose is filmed really well. It's acted really well. The music pumping up and everything. It's this triumphant moment, the way that it's framed. But you're also watching Tony, a character we like, beating the shit out of Kevin, a character that we like. And it's a real bummer, particularly when we've talked about, like, nothing good has happened to Kevin in six seasons at this point. And that yeah. his storyline is getting the shit kicked out of him uh, is not fun to watch. Agreed. And of all the characters, I think we talk about a lot of like their sort of being in their heads, or I do it anyway, and getting their POV. Like this season, I think we 
gotten not a lot of feeling what Betty's actually feeling. She's sort of pretty stoic when it comes to reacting to things. Kevin has this heel turn this season and is a villain, but we're still in his head. Like, we get to see all of his reactions. The camera lingers on him when Pee-Pee's telling him that he's not baby Anthony's real father. And you're just like, oh, you're still crushed by him. But you're he's also being so, he's being legitimately, like, evil. And, like, that's why Moose walks with them to confront Archie at the end of this episode. But otherwise, Moose is like, hey, man, why are you throwing away your friendships for this? Yeah, And that's the voice of reason here. I thought that was such a good moment. And I, I like the idea that Moose is a potential stabilizing factor for Kevin, but it doesn't seem to be working right now. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I like having Moose back on the show. To your point, it was surprising to me that he was walking with them, whether he has been mind controlled in some way of Percival. I think he's just hanging around for Kevin. But I guess we'll see if there's something more nefarious there. I will say. But imagine that moment, Kevin being like, hey, um, we're about to go confront Archie for this union busting thing. You want to come all, come along? And Moose is like, yeah, I'll ride yeah, no with problem. you. I got a break between dodgeball. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't make a ton of sense. I will say this is one last note about this beating up scene. There was a moment when I felt like I didn't really understand the pacifier thing. Like, did Kevin... Oh, Kevin took it for DNA testing. For DNA reason. testing. Yeah. For DNA testing. Uh, you're a parent. I'm a parent. Yeah. If someone takes your baby's pacifier, you're going to kick the shit out of them. Well, 100%. Also, if he was trying to get away with something without being caught, you can't take the pacifier. That's the one <laughs> thing that he's needed. Oh, you my take God. Take any other thing they've put in their mouth. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. Take some hair or something. Baby Anthony looks like maybe he has some hair. A block. Yeah. Go over, see the kid. Hey, play with these blocks. They're all going There's in the kid's mouth. everywhere. Absolutely. Britta's fingers. Probably sucked on Britta's fingers at some point. But do you think Tony's going to come home and be like, hey, hey, where's the B block? <laughs> I see A, I see C, where's B? Yeah. And Britta, Britta the Sitta is like, uh, I don't know. Yeah. The B's gone. I definitely, I know this was not the point of the scene, but legitimately felt that moment and like had panic attacks of times when we lost the kids' pacifiers where – yeah. There was one time I was on a road trip and we had to, we did it, forgot the pacifier. And this is when my kid was like six months old or something. And just screaming, screaming, stopping at every single big store along the way, trying to find not just a pacifier, but the right brand of pacifier. Because, oh, you were trying to get a new one. Yes, we were trying to get forgotten. a new one because we were already too far on the road. It was terrifying. Absolutely. Well, I've, I can't tell you the amount of times I've had to drive back to find um, Duck, my kid's uh, stuffed animal, <laughs> or Tiki, my other daughter's um, former pacifier, but the pacifier nipple part broke, so we cut it off, and now it's just like a little tiny stuffed animal that is, it used to be white, it was a little white rabbit, yeah, fully gray, fully brown gray. <laughs> Terrifying. My brother used to have uh, a blanket called uh, Nunny. <laughs> that he carried around and it literally was like by the time he was old enough it was worn down to a thread and he'd just fall asleep sort of like feeling that thread a little bit that's darling yes so last and maybe nunny maybe nunny will be baby anthony's serpent name oh my god why does he need a serpent name when his name is already baby anthony which is a weird affectation what are they gonna call him what are, no, no, call what, him? are what are i guess fangs is fang serpent name is Tony Tony's serpent name? I don't know, man. Is Baby Anthony going to have to do the serpent dance? Are we going to see, like, dance at Baby Anthony? It's hard to say. I mean, maybe. I don't, I don't know. I clearly don't know how it works. But, like, what's, like, I don't, I get, can anyone use, like, everyone calls Fangs Fangs. Non-serpents call Fangs Fangs. Yeah. Uh, what's his actual name? I don't know. Forsyth I feel like we've heard well. his name. Everybody is named Forsyth? Yeah. Last little bit I wanted to say, very nice to see Britta back again. Loved using her yeah. as a babysitter. Britta, she, what she needs to do is she needs to parent trap Cheryl and Tony. I think that's where we're headed with the show uh, game thing. I see. I'm glad you turned Britta, a character in another storyline, over into some uh, device to get your <laughs> Shoney back together. It's going to happen, man. Mark my words. Um, what real quick on while we're on baby Anthony, we get this conversation between PP oh, yeah. and Kevin where it's like <laughs> – Baby Anthony is the threat? He's the... This season is going to end with Percival straight up fighting a baby. It's going to happen. I mean, 
Great. I'm here for that. It was the but natural progression from Hiram fighting Archie. Hiram's a little older than Percival Pickens, you know, I guess in terms of like how old Mark Consuelos is versus Chris O'Shea. So you got to age it down a little bit. Hiram was fighting Archie as a teenager. Now Percival is fighting baby Anthony as a baby. Yeah, it's, it's uh, it'll be great. I <laughs> baby <laughs> fights are famously hard to uh, show on screen. I don't know sure. exactly how they do that. But it's going to be very cool. Why don't we talk about Jughead and Veronica's storyline, or rather Jughead's storyline, because this had some great moments in here. So good. So Jughead's doing his mentalism act. Percival recruits Reggie, uh, teaches him how to be a ventriloquist very quickly, and he just throws his voice to distract Jughead so Percival can go inside his mind. We got a couple of really cool things here. Uh, as they went inside of his mind, there was the mind door. We got to see FP and Tabitha pick on the side. I think there were some high school picks on the other side. And ultimately, he uh, does break into his mind through the mind door by dressing up with him. That was very hard to watch. Yeah, it was. But I got to say, that was like he even had the Jughead walk down. Mm -hmm. When he walked into the door, I was like... Percival does the research. Um, that was great because I saw that in the promo. They had that shot and legit thought it was Cole Sprouse playing high school Jughead again. So to your point, the way Chris O'Shea nailed it, super awesome. Uh, love the mind door. This whole thing, I mean, this is certainly top of mind yeah. with Stranger Things this weekend, but all of this stuff is very Stranger Things, Eleven, yeah. the Upside Down in a different way, but in a very fun riverdale riffy way. Um, I was surprised that Percival opened up the door, but then there was nothing through it. Like, I was convinced there was going to be some sort of memories. Obviously, they went in a different direction, um, but not, not what I expected, I guess, is my point. Yeah, I agree. And it being more the door wasn't where Jughead was keeping his secrets. It was the control he had over his powers, mm -hmm. the way that he allowed thoughts, in, which I was really surprised uh, by that being sort of what happened. Uh, but I thought it was really cool. Um, I like the I mean, just the line uh, to Reggie, you'll deliver the beanie unto me. I was like, who <laughs> that is some that is some high low taking a like dumb fun thing and raising it to the ceiling was great yeah oh i also wanted to mention this is not for me but when i went through with my family doing the highlights i mentioned that reggie had a ventriloquist dummy that looked like him my oldest kid told me that is from the comics that apparently he does have a ventriloquism battle with archie who also has a ventral uh, ventriloquist dummy like him so there you go that used to be how like really intense um, fights were settled on the streets. Mm -hmm. uh, just before it, that was the original versus, right? Yeah, versus the rap Instagram battles. Except yeah, yeah, it, ventriloquist. It, it ventriloquist. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's it's a shame that all the the ventriloquist dummy industry will never recover from uh, the loss. That scene, like to talk about Reggie for a second when he's like, "Yeah, we got to do this." And he's like, "Hey, when are you going to teach me magic?" <laughs> like, <laughs> that is. So funny. What a, um, uh, you said you were going to teach me. And then the ventriloquist all being like, you want to learn magic? Play with this doll. And Reggie's like, oh, shit. You told me. Also, uh, the fact that Jughead has no idea how to deal with hecklers, like Reggie throws his voice and what he said is like, you suck, Jughead. And Jughead's like, who is it? Who is it? Is it Reggie? What are we doing here? Like, I don't know. Roll with it, man. Get a little more it's very funny that he, Reggie learns how to throw his voice through the ventriloquism doll to just heckle Jughead from like two <laughs> tables over. It's a wild, very small part of this story. Yes, very unimportant. Uh, but it does end up in this place that is important for the overall plot of the series, or at least this season, where Jughead hears all the voices and, as we mentioned, ultimately hides in the bunker because everyone else is too loud. And that's when he starts to hear Rivervale specifically quotes from that to the point that the logo at the end flashes from D to V, the river Dell to the river Vale. And the screen. Very fun. Yeah. And the screen. That very was, fun. that was wild. That was like to have that reveal right now. A lot of episodes left. I'll read the back end of the season is going to be almost as much river Vale as the front of the season. Maybe. Yeah. So I think uh, let's, kind of talk about our theory here of what's happening. Uh, the way that I saw this, and obviously it's early, so we don't know, but we talked about this a little bit. I think 
the reality is probably thinnest in the bunker because that's where River Vale Jughead is. So I do think we're going to get a scene where River Dale Jughead is going to somehow use the bunker to break through to this other reality, probably find out that they all have powers because that leaked through in terms of what happened in River Vale. Potentially the universes are going to be separated, so we're going to see some sort of I don't know, reset there, either in terms of their memory or otherwise, because just thinking ahead, I can't imagine, A, they were going to have superpowers next season, but B, they're going to be like, whew, remember when we had superpowers? That was crazy. Well, anyway. I think they're going to, yeah, separate the universes uh, once again so that whatever is leaking through into Riverdale will be stopped. But I think we're going to get multiple versions of these characters, a sort of multiverse of madness. Um, But I also, the way the last shot is done, it makes me think that, Rivervale Jughead is down that pipe. He's not mm-hmm. in another world. He's there. I The pipe shot was weird, but I do yeah. wonder if it's going to be some sort of, like, that's the tunnel you get through to get exactly. to the parallel universes that's the type portal. thing. Yeah, exactly. And again, it reminds me of a show that I think has some subtle influences on this season of Riverdale that maybe not as many people have watched is this show Dark on mm-hmm. Netflix, uh, which is this German uh, show, three seasons about time travel that is great. Um, definitely worth checking out. It's not nearly as like fun and funny. It's like pretty dark in tone as well. Um but a cool show that seems to be a source for some of this information. Yeah. Uh, Before we wrap up here, any other moments we should call out? Uh, I just wanted to note with Agent Drake, we did talk about that, but she also has a connection to Veronica. She was in the Bureau of Tobacco and Firearms, I believe, trying to track down Hiram, doing a very bad job. Alcohol, tobacco, firearms, uh, the ATF. And yeah, um, she was after Hiram for his rum and jingle jangle operations, which... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's a sentence I want to somehow get framed, uh, embroidered into a pillow or something. Um, and I also thought it was funny. Agent Drake was like, yeah, I used to break up absinthe rings because that stuff's poison. Oh, you're starting a business where it's like a little safer? I'm in. <laughs> uh, and that's, that, again, reinforced my thing. Like, why is she ingratiating herself so much with the, all these characters in Riverdale? Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I do think there is certainly something to everybody pointing out her potentially being suspicious in some way because she has made herself so available, but it could go either way. I don't think he trusts anybody in Riverdale, but as we saw very specifically with Charles this episode, he was trustworthy until he wasn't, until he turned out to be a crazed serial killer, and now he's kind of a nice guy who's helping out Betty in terms of suggesting a serial killer convention. So it could be both things at the same time. Well, and that made me think, is Betty putting together a team of serial killers to catch a serial killer because we got a chick mention, like we said. Yeah. Betty's first question was like, "Hey, what's up with Chick? Remember him?" And uh, it, Charles saved by Betty. Convention to get more serial killers in town. What's up? I don't know. When I first heard about this storyline, I thought it was going to be like the classic Sandman storyline, where it was a serial killer, uh, a convention for serial killers. But this yeah. seems different. This seems like true crime podcast aficionados rather than the trash bag killer sitting on a paddle being like how I did it, you know, or anything like that. Yeah. So, but we'll see, I guess. It's also the musical episode. They're going to be doing musical numbers from American Psycho, the musical, which Roberto Aguirre Sacasa wrote the book for. So that should be very fun as well. So yeah. it's going to be wild. Very excited. Very wild. A couple other just small things to say here. I thought it was funny when Alice was like, he has sepsis or leukemia. Nobody knows. I was like, those are very different. Things. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a doctor, but I feel like someone could put their finger on which one of those two things it is. Also, the fact that Alice was like, we're going to put him in your room, Betty, when there's yeah. many other rooms in the house that he could go yeah. in. Famously, there's a lot of people that used to live there that don't now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, very true. So they could definitely do that. Um and yeah, I guess that uh, the Veronica being brought in is um, to like to clean out Charles, putting Betty and Veronica sort of more and more together this season, I think is really exciting. I, I thought that was great. I mean, it was such a little moment, but having them call each other B and V, it was just so nice to hear that again. And it looks like we're yep. going to be getting more of it next episode. So great. 
again, I have reservations about the overall plot, but seeing all the characters work together, seeing these pairings that we haven't seen in a really long time, that makes me very happy. That's very pleasing to watch as a fan of the show. Before yeah. we wrap up here, who was the MVP this episode? Justin? I'm not going to uh, go a little bit different, and I'm going to call for an MVPP. Because I think Percival was uh, okay. in rare form um, today. I think his uh, t- putting donning the uh, the beanie that he had, was brought unto him, I thought was really cool. And seeing him do a full on uh, Jughead impression as he entered the the doorway was was really cool. Uh, shout out to the photos um, of being um, FP and Tabitha. Mm-hmm. On the wall, if Pete were here, I would rub it in that there was not a not a shade of Betty there. I think they were on the other side, actually. Not to didn't see it. Oh, okay, there we go. Didn't see it. It wasn't <laughs> emphasized. It wasn't emphasized. I think there were. I think there were things from throughout his history. They just sort of highlighted FP and Tabitha on the left side of the door. Interesting. But, Why would they choose to do that? What are you now that you and you your Shoney uh, obsession? You, you now you're identifying with Pete's bughead. Listen, I'm Shoney and Game. As you know from the very first episode of the podcast, I've always been Agent Drooper as well. That yeah. <laughs> I always wondered pilot. what you meant when you said Agent Drooper. I thought yeah, that if was you a go nickname. back and listen to the first episode of the podcast, and actually, if you go even farther back and listen to my radio serials, you can hear mm. that I've been I've been shipping Agent Drooper for decades now, and my great grandfather yeah. shipped it as well. Your grandfather was like, yeah, Agent Drooper is going to make it. <laughs> I love my, those old serials. I, my MVP actually is going to be Betty this episode. Betty all day, er day, as I always say. Uh, I, I just think the way that Lily Reinhardt played the scenes in this episode were really good. I really do love the Charles-Betty relationship because it's so twisted and messed up, but the way she and Wyatt Nash play off each other is really good. The Alice stuff after last episode where she was like, get out of here. You're a terrible daughter. And she's like, can you please just be nice to your serial killer brother? It's and then still- later, let me kill my son, my serial killer son. <laughs> Alice is all over the place, but Betty holding it steady. Betty, steady, Betty. Steady, I call Betty. Her. Steady, Betty. Um, just really good. Just in a good, enjoyable, very weird Riverdale storyline. And next week looks to be even better. And if you'd like to support this podcast, patreon.com slash comic book club. Also, we do a live show every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. to Crowdcast and YouTube. Come hang out. We'd love to chat with you about Riverdale. Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, or the app of your choice to subscribe, listen, and follow the show at Riverdale Dark on Twitter, Riverdale After on Instagram, Riverdale After Dark on Facebook, comicbookclublive.com for this podcast and many more. Until next time, we'll see you after dark. Could be sepsis, leukemia, dog bite, a funny hat. We have no idea, but something's killing it. <laughs>